murdered a podcast i have to apologize i'm so sorry about last week i just went on this absolute rampage of like deep cleaning and reorganizing and decluttering my house i ended up getting the kids new bed frames new mattresses new pillows new sheets blanket like the whole nine we redid their entire bedrooms we went from like regular seven-year-old bedrooms to like preteen rooms and I hate it here. (laughs) Somebody come and get me because this is not, how am I even old enough to have kids this old? I don't know. But it was like Wednesday evening when I realized that it was Wednesday and I had spent the entire day putting beds together and there was just not enough time. By the time I got done with that, I was on to the next room in the closet and I ordered vacuum sealing bags for the blankets and sheets and towels. My house is organized now though, so that's good. So this week we're back at it like normal. Again, I'm really sorry. So this week is a tough one. It is a really tough one. So strap in for that because this is rough. This week we're talking about Denise Huber. So, with all that being said, and without further ado, let's get it. Denise Huber was born on November 2nd in 1967 to her parents Dennis and Lone Huber. It's either Eon or Lone. I'm going to go with Lone. But she was born in Modesto, California. Denise was the oldest of her parents' two kids, She was funny and intelligent, and she had a love for learning and laughing and also making other people laugh. She was described by her brother as being a little bit of a tomboy growing up. She was a jeans and t-shirt type of girl, which, same. He also described Denise as being extremely athletic. Denise did really well in school, and she loved books and nature and absorbing nature and absorbing life around her. Denise graduated high school in 1985 from Los Angeles Baptist High School, and from here, Denise attended a few different colleges and eventually graduated from the University of California, Irvine. She graduated with a degree in social sciences in 1990. And from 1990 on, Denise continued living with her parents, and she started working at a local restaurant called the Old Spaghetti Factory, and I'm pretty sure she did like a part-time department store job also. And when I say that Denise attended a few different colleges, she did a couple of years in Tennessee, and then she went back to California, and I'm not really sure why, but what I do know is that the Huber family moved around a ton because of Denise's dad's work. Dennis's job would relocate him, and the entire family would move with him, and then a few years later, they would relocate him again, and so on and so forth. But in 1990, the Huber family was back in Newport Beach, California after her dad's most recent transfer for his job. And Denise was in a weird spot in her life where she wasn't sure exactly what she wanted to do with her life as far as, like, her career was concerned. Which I've always thought that this idea that people between the ages of, you know, 18 to 25 are just automatically supposed to know what they want to do for the entire rest of their lives. I guess some people do know exactly what they want to do with their lives, but I feel like the mass majority of us are clueless. At least at that age. And this is kind of where Denise was in life at the time. So at the time, Denise was working at the old spaghetti factory, and she was back living at home with her parents. And she was also dating a guy named Steven that she worked with. 
So Denise seemed like your very typical American 23-year-old, and she was. She was figuring out her life, trying to figure out what her purpose was, and she had her toes in the dating pool. All relatively normal things. But on Sunday, June 2nd of 1991, things would change for Denise and her entire family. And before we go any further, I do just want to say that this murder was so senseless and so unnecessary and actually only solved by happenstance. So on Sunday, June 2nd, 1991, Denise was 23 years old and she had tickets to go see a concert later that evening. Denise had gotten these concert tickets for her and her boyfriend Stephen weeks before the actual date of the concert. But plans got changed at the last minute. Stephen hadn't been able to get off of work for whatever reason, so he wasn't going to be able to make it to the concert with Denise that night. And since Denise did have two tickets, and since Stephen wasn't going to be able to go, Stephen and Denise decided that she should just ask somebody else to go with her. Neither one of them wanted to waste the tickets, and Denise had been pretty excited to go, so this was kind of the new plan. Denise would just ask someone else to go in the place of her boyfriend, Stephen. And she did. Denise asked a friend and co-worker named Rob if he wanted to go with her instead, and Rob agreed. The two of them were just friends, and this was a way for the extra ticket. It wasn't going to get wasted. It wasn't going to be a waste of money. So once it was time to head out to the concert... Denise picked Rob up from his place in Huntington Beach, and the two headed off. But once Rob and Denise made it to the concert venue, they pre-gamed in the parking lot for a little bit together before the show actually started. They both knew how outrageously expensive drinks and stuff would be once they got into the concert venue, so they got out the vodka and orange juice that they'd brought with them, and they just drank together in the parking lot before the concert ever started. Once inside and during the concert, Rob did end up buying one 20-ounce beer that they just kind of shared throughout the show. And once the show was over, Denise and Rob decided that instead of going straight home, that they would stop by a restaurant in Long Beach, California. This restaurant had a bar, so the two just sat at the bar and they had a few more drinks, and they actually ended up hanging out at the bar until last call. And after last call, neither Rob or Denise had really drank enough to be, like, too intoxicated to drive. So, Denise drove Rob back home and dropped him off at his place at around 2 a.m. And for clarity's sake, we all know I do this, I'm not sure why, but this would have technically been June 3rd, since they had started out together hanging out and, you know, she dropped him off after midnight. Now, the plan had always been for Denise to drop Rob off at his house and then drive herself right back home. But later on that morning, on June 3rd, Denise's mom just stuck her head in to see if Denise was home, just to kind of check on her, but Denise wasn't there. Now, granted, Denise was 23 years old, so it wasn't too far-fetched to think that maybe Denise had stayed over at a friend's house or something like that. Because Denise's room didn't look like she'd ever come home the night before after the concert. And after Denise's mom called around to a few of Denise's closest friends, None of them had seen or heard from her that morning at all. So, friends got in touch with Rob, and he let them know that he hadn't seen or spoken to Denise since she dropped him off at his place earlier that morning after the concert. So, now, none of Denise's friends know where she is, and Rob hadn't seen her since she dropped him off, and presumably, she'd never even made it home after she dropped Rob off. So, at this point, everyone was a little worried. Denise had told her parents before she left for the concert that she would be back home later, and she even said that she wasn't planning on staying out too late. So, for her not to have come home at all, and for none of her friends to have heard from her, alarm bells were kind of going off for everybody who knew Denise. Now, one of the first calls that Denise's mom made was to Tammy, who was really good friends with Denise. And after realizing that no one had seen or heard from Denise... Tammy just took it upon herself to go back and drive the same route that Denise would have driven to take Rob home after the concert. And it worked, because at about 10 p.m. on the evening of June 3rd, Tammy spotted Denise's car, which was a 1984 Honda Accord. Denise's car was pulled off of the main road, though, almost like she had been pulled off the road so that it would be, like, out of the way for passing traffic. Denise's car had been found on the Corona Del Mar Freeway right before the exit for Newport Beach, which would have been the direction that Denise would have had to have taken in order to get home. But when the car was found, Denise wasn't with the car, 
And after looking at the car, it was discovered that one of the tires on the car was flat. You could also see markings on the road from what's believed to have been from Denise having a tire blow out and her having to kind of slam on the brakes. So, of course, Tammy gets in touch with Denise's parents to let them know that she had found Denise's car. And once Denise's parents arrived to where her car was found, they noticed the flat tire and the markings on the road, but they also noticed that all of the windows in the car were down and that the battery of the car was dead. And then they spot Denise's pantyhose in the front passenger seat of the car because the night of the concert, Denise had been wearing a black top, a black miniskirt, black pantyhose, and black heels. But according to Denise's parents, this wasn't out of the usual for Denise to take her pantyhose off once she was inside of her car. Her mom says that Denise was just more comfortable driving without pantyhose on. So it's not really out of the realm of normal that Denise would have taken her pantyhose off, you know, after she was in the car by herself once she dropped Rob off at his place. So it wasn't weird to find Denise's pantyhose in the front passenger seat of her car. But it was a little weird that all of Denise's other things that should have been in her car were missing. Her purse wasn't in the car, her wallet wasn't in her car, like all of her most important and personal things were gone from the car. And after finding Denise's car in the shape that it was in, that's when the Hubers decided that it was probably time to go ahead and file a missing persons report and to get the police involved in the search for Denise. And once the missing persons report was filed, police didn't play this, oh, she may have ran away or maybe she just wants to be missing game. Instead, they took the Hubers seriously and they started their investigation immediately after Denise had been reported missing. But there wasn't really a lot to go off of as far as Denise's car was concerned. There didn't appear to be any sign of a struggle, and the only things that were missing were things that Denise would have likely taken with her out of her car if she had to walk somewhere for help. And it's important to note that there were quite a few emergency call boxes in the area where Denise's car was found. So this was 1991, it would have been pre-cell phone, And these emergency call boxes were exactly what they sound like. An emergency call box would have been the easiest and most practical way to alert authorities to an emergency situation, especially in 1991. It's also important to mention that the area where Denise's car was found not only had multiple emergency call boxes in the area, but the area was also pretty well lit. So, it's not like her car was found in some dark, empty, abandoned side street or back alleyway. Her car was found on a well-lit freeway with multiple ways for her to reach out for help. But Denise had never used those call boxes to reach out for help that night. Now, police were searching the scene where Denise's car was found with helicopters, and those helicopters were equipped with infrared flashlights. There were multiple officers doing ground searches searching the area, even for the slightest pieces of evidence. They even brought in scent-tracking sniffer dogs, and the dogs were able to find Denise's scent, and they were able to track Denise's scent. But the dogs indicated that Denise's scent just abruptly stopped just a few yards from where her car had been parked and found. And this kind of led police to believe that Denise had likely either gotten into another car freely, or she had been forced into another car against her will, which either way would have explained, you know, why the sniffer dogs could only track her scent for a few yards before the scent was gone for good. And from here, it didn't take long for police to rule out the idea that Denise had just run away. There was evidence that she had a healthy relationship with her parents, and there was also evidence to show that this just wasn't in Denise's character. Now, once the runaway option was ruled out, Police then started treating Denise's case as a likely missing persons case, and police really did their damn thing with this one. They really did, especially considering that there wasn't really any evidence to go off of at all. Denise had planned to go straight home after dropping Rob off, and there was no sign of a struggle near her car. There was no sign of blood. There were no eyewitness accounts. So, police did the next best thing. So... Police actually set up an officer to just stay parked nearby where Denise's car had been found, and this officer only had one job. 
His one job was to write down the license plate numbers of as many cars as he possibly could that passed by where Denise's car had been found. And police did this so that they could run those license plates and find the information of the people who were driving the cars in the area where Denise's car was found. Now, after this list of license plate numbers was converted into a list of names, and once police had this list of names, officers went door-to-door asking people who had to drive that route to work every day if they had seen anything out of the usual, you know, on the night that Denise didn't make it home after her concert, which this is kind of genius. I mean, they, you know, most people are only traveling that late for a few reasons, And likely this is something that they do day to day. So sitting an officer in that spot at that same time just to see who drives by there is, I don't know, it's like a little bit genius for me, I feel like. Denise's parents spent the next few weeks making sure that everyone remembered Denise's name and making sure that missing persons flyers were everywhere. And they were also able to raise reward money in hopes that this would encourage somebody to come forward with any new information. And it was just a few days after Denise was initially reported missing that the police captain, Tom Lazar, was speaking with reporters about Denise's case, and he was quoted saying, quote, We have feelings about these things, and this one doesn't feel good. Now, of course, Rob was the last person to have seen Denise alive, so naturally, police want to talk to Rob. And when Rob was brought in for questioning, he laid out the events of the night of the concert to police. He told them everything that he and Denise had done and named off anywhere that he and Denise had gone together, which we already know. Denise picked Rob up for the concert. They had a few vodka and orange juices in the parking lot. They went in, watched the concert, left the concert, went to a bar where they had a few more drinks, and afterwards, Denise dropped Rob off at home. And she was supposed to have been going straight home after dropping Rob off. And this is exactly what police told Rob. Rob was even able to remember that he had gotten dropped off by Denise at 2.05 a.m. And Rob says that he remembered the time, 2.05 a.m., because he had looked at the clock thinking about how many hours it would be before he would have to get up and get ready for work the next day. So if Rob was right, then he was dropped off at 2.05 a.m., which at least gives us a little bit of a tighter timeline. And while police were questioning Rob, It was evident that he did kind of have a crush on Denise, but even according to Rob, she had set her boundaries and they were clear, and Rob had been able to respect her boundaries, and the two of them were strictly friends. Now, police brought Rob in over and over and over again since he was the last person to have been with Denise, but every time Rob was brought in and questioned, his story never changed, it never wavered, And eventually, police even convinced Rob to take a polygraph test, which he did. And it was once Rob passed this polygraph test with absolutely no problem that police decided that it may be time to try and look into any other suspects. So they bring in Stephen, Denise's boyfriend at the time. But Stephen had been at work, and his story never changed, and police couldn't find anything to connect connect him to Denise's disappearance either. Denise's parents were able to get Denise featured on America's Most Wanted, which in turn led to like a flurry of tips and information from all over, but nothing ever panned out. And police were running out of leads and even running out of suspects. There were psychics that were calling the Huber family and claiming to have information and knowledge about Denise's whereabouts. And even though the Hubers weren't sure that psychics would be able to help, They did still always pass along anything that the psychic said to police, just in case. The Adam Walsh Research Center even stepped in and agreed to help in the search for Denise, even though they primarily help with children missing persons cases. But still, months would pass with absolutely no new evidence, tips, or leads. And it wasn't that the police weren't trying, because they were. And so were Denise's family and friends. Everyone was doing everything that they could, but it seemed to be leading absolutely nowhere. Eventually, the Huber family had been able to raise like $10,000 in reward money on their own just through private donations. And Denise's parents kept Denise's story in the media and on the news and on any TV programs or shows that would agree to air her information. 
and police had a theory, but they didn't have much else. Police theorized that Denise had a blowout on her car with a tire, and that when she pulled off the road that she was approached and or abducted by a stranger. And we say it all the time, but stranger abductions are so rare, they don't seem like they're rare because of the way that true crime tends to focus on those cases more heavily, but they are extremely rare. But in this case, that really did seem to be the most plausible and logical situation. The dogs had lost Denise's scent a few yards from her car, so that kind of makes sense there. And then all of the, like, quote-unquote usual suspects, like friends, family members, boyfriends, police had been able to rule all of these people out already. So, in hopes that a fresh set of eyes might help, Denise's parents ended up hiring a private investigator. And the P.I. actually didn't think that this was a stranger abduction. He actually thought that Denise had been abducted nowhere near her car, and that she had been murdered, and that her murderer just left the car randomly on the side of the freeway to throw off the investigation. So the P.I. thought that Denise's killer had staged the car to make police think that this was the crime scene so that police wouldn't be looking anywhere else. So basically the P.I. and the police had total opposite theories, which is fine, like let's rule everything out, but once the P.I. wasn't able to find any evidence to back his theory up, he basically just handed the case back over to law enforcement where it essentially went cold. The investigation came to almost a complete standstill, because even after putting so much time into this missing persons case and into this investigation, police still weren't any closer to figuring out what happened to Denise, who did it, and why. Police had worked every lead, every tip, and checked in on any potential eyewitness sightings, and absolutely nothing brought investigators any closer to finding Denise or learning what happened to her. And this case would remain cold and unsolved for the next three years. But three years after Denise went missing, it would end up being two complete strangers and a gut feeling that would blow this case wide open. So let's jump ahead from June 1991 to July of 1994, which would have been about three years since Denise had been reported missing. So in July of 1994, we're in Prescott Valley, Arizona. This is where we're introducing a married couple named Elaine and Jack Court. Now, Elaine and Jack had moved to Arizona to retire in the early 90s, and as a way for them to bring in a little extra income, the couple would go to, like, flea markets and swap meets and outdoor markets where they would sell paint and paint supplies. And it was at one of these flea markets where Jack and Elaine met a man who was selling paint supplies. This man was John (laughs) Farmalero. (laughs) I <laughs> screw it up every time. This man was John Famalero. And once Jack and Elaine start talking to John about the paint supplies that he had sitting out for sale, John tells the couple that he actually has a ton more paint supplies at his house that they might be interested in. You know, they all three sold the same kinds of things as far as like paint and paint supplies. So John tells the couple that he has more paint and supplies that they might be interested in back at his house if they wanted to set up a time to come by and take a look to see if they could find anything that they could possibly resell, that that would be fine. John lived in Prescott Valley, and the couple agreed to go out to John's house just to see what all he had that they might be able to buy at a discounted price and be able to resell. And Elaine and Jack agreed, so they set up a time to go by John's house to see what all kind of supplies he had. And once the couple arrived at John's house, Elaine instantly had a feeling that she says that she couldn't seem to shake. But she and Jack bought whatever supplies that they wanted from John, and they got in their car to leave. Once the couple was back in their car, though, Jack and Elaine were both talking to each other about how weird it was that John had this massive rider moving truck just sitting in his backyard. And this next part, you're probably going to hear my dog stomping on the floor because this is his name. It's even spelled the same. So I feel like he's going to think I'm talking to him, even though I'm talking to you. But let's keep going. (laughs) So a rider truck is basically like a U-Haul truck. It's just a completely different company. So these aren't the kinds of like rental cars where you would park them at your house for a long period of time. Because, you know, these trucks, you would typically rent these 
rental trucks for as short as time as possible because, quite frankly, they're expensive as hell. But while Jack and Elaine had been looking through the supplies that John had for sale, it was pretty clear to both of them that this rider truck had been parked in John's backyard for a while. And then on top of that, John had actually told Jack in an earlier conversation that he had moved to Arizona six months ago. So that would mean that the rider rental truck would have been parked in John's yard for at least six months, which again is weird because rider rental trucks aren't for like long-term rentals. You pile your junk in a rider truck and you drive it to wherever it's going and then you take the truck back as soon as possible. So this was kind of weird all by itself. But John had a tarp thrown over this rider rental truck and he just had like paint cans and supplies that were all just kind of scattered around this truck. And then John and Elaine noticed that there was also a drop cord or an extension cord as most of y'all probably call it. But this extension cord was coming from inside of the back of this rider rental truck and it led to a plug-in. So the cord was presumably plugged into something that was running that was powered on inside of the back of this rider truck. Jack and Elaine both thought that this was so strange that they actually jotted down the license plate on that rider rental truck. And the license plate wasn't an Arizona license plate, but that's not really uncommon for these types of moving trucks to have license plates from another state because they'd be rented by someone driven to another state, dropped off, and then rented by somebody else, potentially in a whole other state. But Jack and Elaine could both just tell that that rider truck had been parked in John's yard for a while. And initially, Elaine and Jack wondered if maybe John had stolen this rider moving truck. So the next time that Elaine saw a friend of the couple's that was either like a detective or a deputy, I don't know, some kind of Arizona police officer... She mentioned to him that she thought this rider truck may have been stolen, and she gave her friend, who again was in some branch of law enforcement, she gave him the paper that she had written the license plate number on. And she just kind of suggested that he might want to look into it. Now, once the detective got in touch with the rider truck company, it was learned that this truck was actually stolen, and that it had been stolen from Orange County, California. So, after confirming that this rider truck was, in fact, stolen, the sheriff's office was made aware of the stolen truck and a deputy was sent out to John Famolaro's house to investigate the stolen truck. Once the investigator made it to John (laughs) Famolaro's house, I'll get it one day, y'all, he just checked the VIN number on the rider truck to see if it matched the VIN number of the truck that the rider company had confirmed was stolen. And lo and behold, both VIN numbers were the same. This was the rider truck that had been stolen out of Orange County, California. So the deputy knocked on the door of the house, but he got no answer. And then the deputy noticed the extension cord coming from the back of the rider truck. But the back door of these kinds of rentals actually open in the same way that a garage door is opened and closed. So even though the deputy could see that there was an extension cord coming from the back of this rider truck, the rider truck was padlocked shut. But just the sight of the extension cord coming from inside the rider truck, along with all the chemicals and paint cans sitting around outside, the deputy originally thought that maybe this was some kind of drug lab that he'd stumbled across. And that can get pretty dangerous pretty quickly. So the deputy called the narcotics team to come out and take a look around, but they found no evidence that any of these chemicals were drug related. Because at this point, this deputy has no idea that John actually sells paint and paint supplies. So to him, all of this paint thinner and chemical bottles looked like something that you might find in a drug lab. And although the narcotics team was able to rule that out, the deputy couldn't get over the extension cord and the padlock on the door of the rider truck. But since John still wasn't home, there was really only one thing that could be done, and that was to try to get a search warrant to be able to get into the back of this truck to see what might be going on. So the deputy sent over the necessary paperwork to get a search warrant, and while he waited for the search warrant to be approved, he went ahead and called a locksmith and had them on site and waiting for when the warrant was granted. 
And all of this happened super quickly. So, like, the deputy went out, knocked on the door, got no answer, looked around, got the narcotics team out there, sent in a search warrant, and called the locksmith out, like, all within an hour or so. Once the search warrant was signed off on, the locksmith was standing right there waiting for the go-ahead to cut the padlocks on the back of this rider truck. Once the locks were cut and the door was opened, deputies saw more paint cans and more supplies, tools, etc. But then the deputy followed that extension cord to as far back in the truck as you can get, and that's when he found a deep freezer. This freezer was a chest freezer type, so the door would open horizontally and not vertically like a fridge. This freezer was what that extension cord had been plugged into, so it was powered on and running. This freezer also had large pieces of, like, heavy-duty tape covering the seams where the lid and the freezer seal lid close and they meet. And once they looked, they saw that the freezer was also padlocked shut, which is weird all by itself. So, the locksmith popped the lock on the long rectangular freezer and the deputy pulled the pieces of tape off the lid. Once the freezer was opened, the air was filled with the undeniable smell of decomposition. There was dried blood in different areas of the freezer and the freezer was full of large black trash bags. The deputy opened the bags that were covered in frost and that's when it was discovered that this freezer had been used to store the nude body of Denise Huber. Denise was found in this freezer with her hands cuffed behind her back and a cloth in her mouth and her face covered in tape. And of course, as soon as it was discovered that there was a body inside of this freezer, a forensics team was called out to the scene along with additional officers. Once all these bags were cut away and the body was removed from the freezer, the officers noted that this murder likely happened somewhere else just because of the lack of blood spatter in the freezer and in the rider truck. This rider truck, along with everything in it, were going to be sent to a forensics lab while Denise's body was going to be taken to the medical examiner's office for an autopsy. Now, of course, at this point, police don't know that this body was of Denise Huber, but we know that it was. At the same time that police were questioning John's neighbors to see what they knew about the truck or about John... John actually pulled into the driveway that was now swarming with police and forensics. John was immediately arrested for felony theft of the rider truck, which was all police needed to charge him with at the time until they were able to do a more thorough investigation on the truck, the body, and the murder. So police would at least be able to keep John in custody until they figured out why there was a freezer with a body of a dead woman in a rental truck that John had stolen. The medical examiner started the autopsy on who we now know was Denise, and they found that her face had suffered from tons of injuries and that her skull was, for lack of a better word, busted into multiple pieces. And I don't want to get into too many graphic details, but there were pieces of the bags that the head and body were wrapped in that the pieces of bags were found inside of some of the injuries to Denise's face indicating that the bag had been put over her head and then the injuries were inflicted, which that would explain how the pieces of plastic bags ended up actually inside of some of the injuries. The official cause of death was listed as blunt force trauma to the head, and there were almost no injuries to any other part of Denise's body besides her head and face area. And at first, the medical examiner actually didn't think that Denise had been sexually assaulted. But after the body was allowed time to, again, for lack of a better word, thaw out, they found that there were signs that Denise had been anally raped. Afterwards, prints were taken, and it would only take two days for those prints to confirm that this was, for sure, the body of Denise Huber. Denise's family had been without answers for three years at this point, and while they all say that this wasn't the outcome that they were hoping for, that it was still better than the not knowing, which is heartbreaking and even more so because Denise and John didn't know each other whatsoever. And how did she end up in Arizona? What was the motive? So let's talk about it. Searches of John's house back in Arizona proved that they definitely had the right guy. 
Not only was Denise's body found inside of the Ryder rental truck that John had stolen, but inside of his hoarder-style house, police also found tons of Denise's personal items that had never been recovered after her disappearance. Inside of John's house, police found all of the clothes that Denise had been wearing on the night that she was last seen, and in the same box as Denise's clothes, there were also a pair of men's pants and a sweatshirt that were stained with blood. In that same box, there was a bloody hammer and some surgical gloves that had been, like, taken off inside out. And then on top of all of that, a lot of Denise's things had been found in a different cardboard box labeled Christmas. Inside of this box was Denise's purse, her car keys, her wallet, her checkbook, her ID, her makeup, just everything that she would have, just everything that should have been found inside of her car. And a lot of these things were found with blood stains on them. They were either torn or broken. Obviously a struggle. Police were also later able to find the empty manufacturer box that the handcuffs had been, you know, used on Denise's wrist had come in. So when, when I say that he kept souvenirs, I mean he kept everything. He had moved more than 400 miles away from California to Arizona it had been more than three years since Denise was last seen, so that means that John would have had to have packed all of these things up to take them with him during his move from California to Arizona, and who does that? Who packs the box that handcuffs come in and packs the plastic surgical gloves that he used to murder her? These are gloves like what the doctor would use and then take off and throw in the trash but instead he packed them up in a box and kept them. And as if all of that wasn't enough to tie John to Denise's murder, police had even been able to find the receipt from where John bought the freezer that he had stored Denise's body in. And he'd actually bought that freezer a week after Denise was last seen. And this is what I mean when I say that police searched his hoarder-style house. Like, how did he even have the receipt from a freezer that he bought three years ago and 400 miles away. Make that make sense. Also, during the search of John's house, police discovered stacks of newspaper clippings from where newspapers had covered Denise's disappearance, and this sick fuck even recorded the episode of ID that ran Denise's story. So, as it turns out, John had been living in a warehouse that he was also working at in California at the time of Denise's disappearance, in 1991. John had been using this warehouse to live in and he was working out of this warehouse as a painter. So when police went back to that warehouse in California, they were able to find Denise's blood on the floor and walls of the warehouse. And police also pulled some of the sheetrock or drywall from the wall where most of the blood spatter had been found on, you know, the floor and the uh, walls. And behind that piece of sheetrock was a massive blood stain that had obviously been there for a while. So this would indicate that this warehouse was likely the crime scene, and police were able to take swabs of the blood that they'd found on the floors and walls of this warehouse, and the blood came back as a positive match to Denise and her murderer, John. And you won't be surprised to learn that this warehouse was literal minutes away from where Denise's car had been found, and I'll try to post as many pictures as I can find on the social medias so that you can kind of look through some of this as, like, evidence. So police kind of theorized that Denise dropped Rob off after the concert and that when she was on her way home, she realized she had a flat tire and she pulled over on the freeway. Police think that John probably ran across Denise and offered her help with her tire, and whether or not Denise agreed to take his help or not, Police speculate that John probably hit Denise over the head before she had the opportunity to fight back or make a scene. They believe that after this, you know, John had Denise incapacitated, that he drug her into his vehicle and then drove her to the warehouse where he was living and working, and Denise's shoes that were found in John's house during the search in Arizona after her body was found, those high heels kind of back up what police think happened because Denise's high heels had scuff marks all over the backs of them as if the person wearing them had been drugged, and one of the heels were even broken. 
And police theorized that John then took Denise back to the warehouse where he raped her before killing her. So this most definitely seems like a crime of opportunity. Like John just so happened to have run across Denise when she was broken down and he just pounced on the opportunity. And when police started to question how John had been able to get Denise and this freezer from California to Arizona without raising any suspicions, police learned that John had actually hired a couple of teenage kids to drive the rider rental truck from California to Arizona for him. And these teenagers even knew about the freezer. Now, granted, the teenagers didn't know that there was a human body in the freezer, but they were instructed by John to stop every hour during this drive so that they could plug the freezer up to keep the meats cold. John made these teens believe that the freezer was just full of deer meat, and they, of course, they weren't able to open the freezer because it was padlocked shut. So all these teens really had to go on was what John was telling them. So they believed that they were hauling a freezer full of deer meat. Now, on the same day that Denise's body was found, police had already found enough evidence to arrest John for the stolen rider truck, but also for first-degree murder. And on July 18th, 1994, John Familaro pled not guilty for the murder of Denise Huber, which is actually laughable because, sir, you are most definitely guilty. <laughs> And naturally, with all of this evidence that was collected and used against John during his trial, John's defense attorney claimed that all of this evidence was circumstantial, and he even said at one point that he had every confidence in John being innocent. Now, I get it. This is a defense attorney's job, but I'm pretty sure that having a woman locked in a freezer in your backyard being stored in a stolen moving truck and you having all of her missing clothes and belongings is not at all circumstantial evidence. But hey, I didn't go to law school, so I could be wrong. I mean, I'm not wrong, but I could be. The jury found John guilty for the first-degree murder of Denise Huber and then guilty of the kidnapping of Denise Huber. John Famolaro was sentenced to death, where he is currently awaiting his execution on death row in San Quentin State Prison in California. And I just feel like Denise wasn't this guy's first victim. I just feel like mm, there's probably more. And as I was looking into John a little bit more, I actually saw that the date that he bought the freezer that he kept Denise's body in, the, he bought that freezer on his actual birth date. So that's disgusting. And I think that's all I have for you this week. Patreon members... I got you Friday. Don't worry about it. For real this time, I'm only going to clean my house on Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday. So don't worry about it. <laughs> and I guess that's it for this week. Let's do it again. Same time, same place, next Wednesday. See you then. That's how my mama murdered a podcast.